For the newly indoctrinated, Jim Butcher's The Dresden Files follows the story of a professional wizard in Chicago. The first book, Stormfront, was published in 2000, and the series now boasts 17 novels, plus a combined 36 short stories, comics, and graphic novels to help flesh out the world. On top of that, The Dresden Files has also produced a television series, card games, and a TTRPG. With all that content, and a ballpark estimate of six coming novels, we've started our podcast as a way to break down the series' most important moments, characters, and lore. Add theories, ramblings, and outside sources, and you've got the number one Dresden podcast for all your interests. This is McAnally's Dresden Files podcast by Free Flow Rambling. Conjure by it at your own risk. Welcome to our second episode, Green Eyes and Broken Hearts, brought to you by Free Flow Rambling. My name is Tanzan, and I'm joined by my co-hosts Maggie and Jess. We're going to talk to you today about Jim Butcher's Stormfronts, Chapters 2 and 3. Harry leaves a note for his 2 p.m. missing persons appointment then walks a few blocks from his office to the Madison Hotel to see how he can help with the police investigation. We meet Lieutenant Karen Murphy, with whom Harry has worked before, and discover that a call girl and a mafia enforcer have been murdered, horribly, and by no means could be achieved other than by magic. Harry is mortified, not simply in the humanity of the situation way, but doubly so that someone could have perverted the use of magic in this way. He relays his initial impressions and findings to Murphy and her partner, and then rushes off to make his appointment. He is stopped quickly and persuaded to accept a ride back to his office from none other than mob boss Gentleman Johnny Marcone. Da, da, da. Okay, so, I mean, we meet Murphy right off the bat, and this is total exact opposite to Harry, where you've got this tall, muscular, dark hair, dark eyes, six foot something guy. Yeah. You've got Semi-muscular. He's kind of gangly wow. more than, more, yeah, I sure. mean, yeah, he is for a, for a almost seven foot tall. Now, this is something else. We pegged his age. Are, are we going to, so same thing. It's not really until book 16, Peace Talks, that Butcher gives him a specific height. It's always a little over six feet or six and a half feet, blah, blah, blah. So, um, I'm just going to jump in and say, yeah, so, mm-hmm. so Harry is like 6'9", apparently is like, so I always had him pegged as like... Bloody six, tall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 6'9". So, so yeah, because he does, he, he varies between like just above six and a half feet to being just under seven. And so apparently this is how much just under. So, so yeah, he's, he's not a shorty. No. He's, yeah. But, you know, then you've got Murphy, who's, you know, hair over under five foot, blonde, cute, soccer mom... Favorite on bitty, bitty like blonde. Very pick her up, put her in your pocket. Totally cute little button nose, sort of a yeah, and sort of a look. Uh, and she will on the surface obliterate anyways. your sexual organs if you mm-hmm. describe her to her face like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she no, no no itty bitty favorite aunt, cute button nose. <laughs> no, so uh, right off the bat, this is when you get into Harry's first kind of his chauvinistic kind of outward. Uh, interactions with women because, you know, instantly him and Murph are in a foot race to the door. For who gets to hold open the door for the other one. Yeah, and I, sort of yeah, I love exactly he's going and, she, you know, right, he sort of speeds up a little bit and she, like, kind of eyes him like she knows what she's doing, so <laughs> she speeds up to get, and then become basically, yeah, like a full-on race to the door and by, by dint of having those longer legs and that's it kind of a thing is he just just gets to there before and holds the door open and she's like, because yeah, Murphy is very feminist that way, very mm-hmm. and and again, it's not even just that Murphy in and of itself is that way, but this is the world she lives in. Yeah, sir. She's had to fight her whole way to the top and she's not about to give an inch Yeah, anywhere. she's Yeah, she is a small delicate female in a cop's world, in a boy's club in a man's man and so, yeah, exactly right. She, she sort of, whether she would want to be or not is completely irrelevant. She's like, that's just not going to fly because the guys, right? Like, to be taken seriously and to earn her position, she cannot for a second ever be seen as anything less than, 
than being right on par with the man. I think there's a reason that that uh, Jim Butcher chose to have such a, a drastic just juxtaposition between these two characters. I mean, I think for exactly that reason, the drastic juxtaposition. Me you know? too. Yeah, I think exactly just for the the contrast that it serves between Harry and and Murphy and and. Everything a little bit in Harry's world is oversized, as you know, we'll come to. In or in this case, undersized. Well, but that's, but this is, but this is what I mean, right? Like, mm-hmm. like Harry's bubble is, right? So Murphy is very, right? She is exactly that exact opposite. Yeah. To, and there's a point in, to, and in extreme. Yeah. And there's a point too where Murphy is very much like, I mean, this is where you kind of see both Harry and Murphy at their best, you know, is constantly heads with each other, but also Murph is a lot more serious and rigid and you have to stick to the rules and there's a way of doing things and Harry is a lot more like fuck you I'm gonna do it my own way a little bit the ends justify the I know I have rules but I kind of want to break them how do I break these rules well yeah kind of like you know like he is his own He, he marches to the beat of his own drum so he's like well in the same way that, you know, like, the president can't ever break the law because the president is the president. Anything he does is lawful. Harry can never <laughs> exactly go against his own rules because anything he ever does is falling within the rights of Harry. Whereas Murphy's a lot more like, no, Till I it follow the police code. I follow. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> but, um, exactly. But then Harry or Murphy is a lot more like, no, like, I follow the rules and the laws. Yeah, and she the ascribes have to been a set of externally imposed exactly. That she's have like, been here for life. I'm a cop. These are exactly the the oaths, the pledges, the yeah. rules. I don't break out on whatever. my own. Yeah, she's like, I can't just, you know, you know phone no book rhyme someone or reason. because I want to, right? Like, yeah, exactly. So she's, she's very much for upholding the law as the law as it is set out. Mm-hmm. And, and... I mean, you know, maybe like the very slight within sort of the interpretation of it, but there's a point where Murphy, she's not an idiot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she's she is gonna like you say, job. she's her own person. She does her own, but it, but exactly, basically, yeah, she's it's, not a mindless robot. But she's Murphy's not a mindless robot, moral but code is much more what is the law laid. Is the yeah, law. yeah. The law is the law. At the same so. time, she definitely has an open mind because otherwise, she wouldn't have been dealing with Harry just in the first place. Which is a huge, you know, nod to her head and the SIs in general, which is totally like you've yeah. got to be open to. And, and yes, she that- does, but she was also sort of pushed into it a little bit because SI is where they send everybody they want to get rid of and who they don't think is right because it's a difficult um, because of that SI is, is, is where you deal with all the stuff that doesn't fit neatly into the reports as Harry puts it and and cannot be easily explained so yeah Tendon. I without being too much spoilers because I, I don't know too many of the side stories yet um, is how does it say how she ends up getting into the SI? Uh, yes, but not in not for I th- yeah it's it it doesn't come up specifically in this book or any of the first few books. Um, is it only in a in a side story that it tells us? Well, I, I it's hard to place exactly when it happens, but I mean, as you'll yeah, learn later, I, I mean, she ever. was more. Her father was part of the original SI, which was then known as the Black Cats. So Murphy was already had a legacy to SI yeah. in a way, which we don't discover until like book seven. That yeah, that's which is much later when you even get that insight. Book six that's mentioned. But um, and then you know even in Restoration of Faith, you know she hasn't made it to SI yet. She's still the regular. She's beat cop. She's still just so yeah, brand new beat cop kind of deal. And has been established in that fan timeline. Uh, it, there's a three year difference between. Uh, when Harry and Murphy first meet, and she's a beat cop, and Harry is lieutenant of SI. So, Karen, Harry's you, never. You know that there's at least something in there those three years, but it's, it won't be mentioned for a little while what exactly got her yeah. moved in. Is, is mm-hmm. that only because that seems like a pretty big jump from three years to beat cop to lieutenant? Uh, it, if it's not three, it's less. Well, and that's just a testament to how hard she works. Well, it, it, it is. Yeah. It definitely is. Yeah, definitely is a testament to her. So, I, uh, yeah, I think the way I viewed it is it's a little bit you have to wonder is, is, is there a little bit of a nod to like predestination there kind of a thing? Yeah. Um, you know, like, oh, is it coincidence that your dad ended up working and now, you know, or is it one of those things that uh, is kind of bound to happen because it's in your DNA somewhere that you were just going to get the short end of the stick with this DNA, you know? <laughs> or exactly is it the fact that, you know, somewhere up in the higher brass is like, oh, that's another Murphy, let's stick her in the same thing. But, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit, 
it's 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 sort of as far as the police hierarchy goes she gets shunted over to SI as a little bit of of a dig a little bit of a punishment a little bit of a um um oh what's the word I'm looking for punishment for being too honest no I was gonna say um more like a dig at her like an embarrassment for like to sort of but um, take her down a peg or whatever. Um, but Murphy is like, hey, fuck you. You're going to give me this disadvantage. I'm going to turn it into an advantage. And that's very much Murphy, right? So both her as her personality and her in this world, because she knows to succeed as a cop exactly, that she's got to work twice as hard as any of the guys or whatever, right? So exactly. So they, they shunted her over here, figuring she'd be like, what the fuck do I do with this? And, you know, quit or, or screw up and get fired like everybody else that, that goes through there. Like, that's basically where they send people to to die. And, you know? Grind the spirit out of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Grind them down and make them quit and that. And she's like, no, fuck you. You're going to put me on. I'm going to be the best damn Right, and that's that's where Harry says too, you know. So so she goes out and hires the only fucking wizard. Like you're like it's all paranormal shit. But they can't call it paranormal shit because they're the cops, and paranormal shit doesn't exist. Right, so it's like fairies are stealing babies and vampires are killing people, but nowhere in the reports can you say, well, a fairy stole a baby or this guy was killed by a vampire. So that's what SI is for to to, to fit it into real world situations non-paranormal to make it fit inside the reports and the lines and the conformities and still figure you know how to get this to court how to get a conviction how to how to wrap this up right so she hires the wizard who's called their psychic you know because she's like well right and then it's proven to work for her so she's going to continue doing it right is is the other side of it right so yeah murphy's had a vague exposure that makes her kind of go oh. well and that's also part of the reason why she also mentions i believe even quite early on in the series if not stormfront that she was just refusing to ask questions and or to stop asking questions she was very pushy and very like she, she was asking too many questions ultimately to the higher yeah. ups well, even with don't the just si itself exactly. carmichael even even if you look at the side stories Carmichael, it, it, who is also an SI, even tries to curb her from doing an honest report. Mm -hmm. He's saying, much a non non Yeah, he's like, yeah, no, this just... isn't going to, we can't tell them we got eaten by vampires. That's not a thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's like, but they got eaten by vampires. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, so whatever, we end up at the hotel. Here's Murphy. Here's Harry. Now let's go on to this case that Karen's yeah. presented with him. And, and it's that this. fun little interaction this. between, right, again, where you see sort of yeah, they've got totally some backstory and camaraderie. But again, like, she gets annoyed with him, but she also sort of appreciates what he's doing and why, right? And even that in itself kind of sets alarm bells going because he's like, oh, shit, she's taking comfort in this for me, where if he doesn't take comfort in shit on the job, so <laughs> this ain't going to be good. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, we meet her partner, Carmichael. Carmichael, who's... Just rails on poor Dresden the entire time until yeah. they get there. Big nom. But yeah, Murphy's not really sure how much is out there, how far it goes, what she believes. But again, she's witnessed a thing or two. She's worked with Harry and gotten results. So she's got that sort of open mind as she's willing. Whereas Carmichael is just like, fuck this shit. Mm -hmm. This is complete yeah, wizard my ass, like, you know, like, yeah. It's, You're another scam artist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, complete. So, yeah, so Harry comes upon this hotel room, um, and you've got this little, uh, I mean, you get insight to his investigation skills right off the bat, you know, first off yeah. into the room is a nice little sitting room, and you've got Harry, he takes note of a thong under the couch of the, uh, the stereo playing out a love song. Yeah. Um, and you get a little bit of like the sense that you know this guy actually does have a professionalism about him. Uses eventually his, uses his pen or pencil or whatever to write, touch things, and not because he knows mm -hmm. not to get his fingerprints on shit. Yeah, and, so the man does know his job. Yeah, um, and is willing to legitimately do it when when needed. Yeah, respect, yeah. and, and that is the other side. Harry does respect the normals. <laughs> right, like he understands the police investigation and that, you know, fingerprints and evidence and how that, right, and he's not going to just yeah, fuck that up and be like, whatever, or I'm just going to catch it, cast a spell, and, right? Yeah, he's a very like, modern day man. He's not some random supernatural guy who's like, I'm going to set up shop in the middle of Chicago because I don't care. Like, he, he knows he, the humans. He is a human. He does understand yeah, human yeah. society. Yeah. And knows that he's... 
Well, and the next thing after that that we get introduced to is the, the, his very humanity. You know, be yes. By being mm-hmm. absolutely horrified, but keeping that professionalism, but hearing this voice in his head that, as he as they put in the books, screaming because of and this just gibbering, vicious yeah. and brutal yeah, murder. It's not a pretty scene. Yeah. And I, and I like that that's another nice little interaction, right? Because he's like pointing out, you know, like the panties in the stereo and Carmichael's all like, oh yeah, thanks, we got that. Like, some help you are. Like, no shit, Sherlock. Um, and then he's all like, you know, they're like, okay, Murphy's like, hey, come on, let's check out the actual, right? And Carmichael's like, oh yeah, I'll have a bucket waiting for you. And Harry's all like, oh, yeah, okay, Carmichael. And then, yeah, literally gets in the room and is like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I'm gonna need that bucket. I'm gonna need that bucket. Yeah, basically, exactly. Literally has to stop himself from, like, hurling the second he walks in. And, yeah, slams the door on that gibbering, screaming part of his mind that is just, like, yeah, so. Mm-hmm. Right, so as uh, you brought up Tanzan, he walks into a horrifying scene. Uh, the did you want to describe? Oh, they're... Uh post uh, or are they mid coitus they're mid coitus yeah mid-coitus. <laughs> and yeah. their 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 chests are quite literally burst from the inside out and that, that there's a visceral evidence everywhere Courage. in the entire in the entire room that the pieces of their hearts have turned into gelatinous goo, goo <laughs> that has been spewed all over the room romantic right mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's pretty horrific, and Harry is not here. Let's see. Um, yeah, so you've got this uh, again, as you said, mid coitus, <coughs> gruesome, disgusting, uh, heart explode outward scene, uh, and Harry does eventually go for the bucket. The second second glance around, <laughs> um, uh, but it's kind of when you first get into the scene of like just how ghastly and horrible this is is that uh there's this impending sense of just wrongness that harry can pick up in the air in the room in the scene and that's kind of when you now start to get the other aspect of harry and the magic is that it's more than just doing and it's much more mental and physical both in the same time it's a legitimate reaction that is you know it, it plays on his senses it hurts him emotionally mentally it's just something that is very well and realizing what that the that that the perversion of magic because it's the the life force that brings life or that brings the magic into reality of, yeah mm-hmm. and to yeah. to use that to snuff out life is just this horrendous wrongness. Exactly, and Harry even goes so far as to, you know, introduce a little bit more lore in the books, is that in order to have done this, you would have need magic to kill, and that is breaking the first law of magic. Yeah, and it also is... mentions the, the White Council for the first time, mm-hmm. and that there are laws to magic. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and they don't lay them all out mm-hmm. yet, but there obviously are some which Harry has to abide by. Some sort of governance out there. Yeah, some sort of governing body, and he's not really allowed to share it because you know um they're okay with with being in the closet they want to stay in the closet and they're like okay we can't even though they try they're like we're not real happy with harry being out there and flaunting it but they're like you don't have to out the rest of us like we don't want that shit we want to just stay yeah. background right and so point, he if you can't want- really talk about them and their you know the first rule of wizards club is you can't talk about wizards club exactly <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so. And no muggles included. No, yeah, keep the muggles out. We're not. Exactly. So to a point, it's like, you want to appear like a kook to the world, fine. But, you know, you leave us out of it or we're really going to get involved and you're not going to be happy about that. So there is a little bit of fear from Harry there. Like, okay, no, like, they don't like me. I really have to shut up. I cannot share this. Yeah, and we don't really know why there's there's an issue there between what that is, but... Yeah, she's basically just like, okay, solve this, do it. And he's like, I, I, I can't really. <laughs> I, no. Yeah, no. And that's one of the things I kind of like about the way the rules and stuff work in this. Like, in the Potterverse, it's a little bit like whatever you can imagine and say will just will just happen, right? Like, mm-hmm. you, you just conjure magic up out of nothing and make it happen. Whereas in Harry's world, that's not really how that works. One, there is, I mean, it still sort of follows the natural laws of the universe, right? So you cannot just 
you know, matter cannot be created and destroyed, right? Everything um, has... Physics is still physics. Physics is still physics. Everything has an equal and opposite reaction, and right? So he's like, yeah, you can figure out a way to summon up the fire, but when it gets here, it's going to act like fire. It's just going to do whatever fire does, right? So you may, you may get it here by a different means. Um, yeah. I was going to say, it's like a dual uh, double-edged sword is that, you know, in some ways, the Harry Potter universe really, you know, backs itself into a hole because... It's got, Fire, yeah. uh, what is the word for it? Um, uh, no plot. restrictions? No, like plot. Oh. What's that called when you ruin your own plot? Plot holes? It's plot got holes? like, it's got plot hole after plot hole because like, oh, well, like how come this thing solved in the last book? You didn't use it in this book, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's been established, you know, like the time turner can be used to go to like four different like potions classes at once, but you can't just go back in time and stop Voldemort. Like, you know, like it's things like yeah, that. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, when you do have the rules in the Dresden verse, often then you're backing yourself into a corner because I was like, oh, can't do that because I established last book. You can't do that. Or, oh, can't do that because I. So it's like both books kind of have that. Like, you know, the Harry Potter verse has infinite rules for what you can do to get out of it because there are no rules. Yeah. But then the Dresden files is like, no, there's so many rules that sometimes you just like, it's almost easier because then it's like, you don't have these plot holes, but then you have to work that much harder. But then you to have to work within the the confines of what you've created. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, and that's it, why he carries a gun. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, exactly. Um, um, oh, curses! I just. But I was going to say, going back to like his his technology and stuff like that too, right? Like that's one of those things where um, it makes new and interesting ways because exactly he can't just hop on hop on the internet and look up what this is and what's going on or whatever, right? Um, but he still has to find a way to get his information and stuff mm -hmm. like that, right? So it's kind of, again, sort of tempering that lack of technological use with mystical and magical means and stuff like that, right? So sometimes he can find out stuff that Murphy and stuff couldn't easily find out. And sometimes Murphy is just like, you're such a loser. Like, how can you not know this? And he's <laughs> like, well, I don't even get the TV to work anymore. Like, mm -hmm. like yeah, most of his TV and shit was from a kid because... You know, stuff like that is like he has to go to like drive-ins more often because he's far enough away from like the projector and the equipment that he's not going to fuck it up, right? But anyways, um, but yeah, but these these rules um, with the White Council, um, fuck, what else was I saying? There's a governance that must be abided to. We have no idea what he did, but he does clearly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's it. So so that's what I was saying. So with these rules. For him to just write, he can't just be like, well, obviously the guy went hocus pocus and this is what happened. He sort of has to, he has to do it by trial and error, but he has to sort of sit down and figure it out a little bit like a scientist in a lab would, right? Like they can hypothesize and they can have a certain amount of knowing what's going to, but until they actually sit down to create something or invent something, right? It's mm -hmm. how it looks on paper is not always how it plays out in practice. And this is what Harry's got to do, right? He's like, well, I can sort of get an idea, but I got to mess around like with formulas and and you know like like you say sort of the rules and laws of magic that like they can kind of bend and change over time like anything else but there is That's sort of something that they follow and so he's like if i start like i'm gonna have to sit down and work this out and if i start sitting down and work this out like white council might get wind of it and they're gonna be like what you practicing black magic for he's like well no i'm, I'm just testing it yeah yeah you don't need to figure out how unless you want to do it right yeah. So, yeah, he's sort of getting himself in shit that way. He's like, you don't understand. I can't start messing. You know, it'd be like mm -hmm. if a criminal suddenly, you know, started buying, like, bomb ingredients. You guys would shut down that shit pretty quick. You know, you won't just be like, oh, you just kind of want to wonder what might happen if a terrorist did that. Yeah, okay, I get that. No problem, right? Exactly. He's so. like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to dig myself There's in no so much. There's no way for me to look at this. Yeah, I'm, I'm already on their terrorist watch list. I can't stop, start dipping my fingers into terrorist shit. <laughs> exactly. So there's a lot more of the... Well, there's a lot more. It's just yeah, Harry is very yeah, like, and he's yeah, he can't explain you know. that he can't. T you know, Murphy's like, well, just go do this shit, and he's like, I I can't, but I can't tell you why because exactly. the catch twenty two of the book the has catch been twenty two yes totally exactly so, which is again as you said catch twenty two it kind of starts the distrust between like Harry and everyone in his life is often an inform a problem to communicate because often Harry's backed into a corner about what he can and can't say to who yeah and, and sometimes that's by choice sometimes that's Harry. His protective streak, his chivalry, his whatever, being like, "Ooh, no, I, I don't want to. Mm, this is just bad. I don't. You know I, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't want to point you down this rabbit hole. You might get somewhere you don't. And between, like, well, I would tell you, but I've got other things preventing me from, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah, truly really the catch twenty two of the series. Yeah, 
it comes along. So, um, so yeah. So basically, now he's got this this terribly horrific, disgusting um, murder. That yeah. Again, aside from just being a horrific murder, he's like, mm-hmm. there's no other way. Like, this had to be magic. What the fuck? This is bad. And now, how do I figure this out without? fucking around with things I can't and how do I help Murphy and how do I keep her clear of it everything which on top of it all leads to Harry at least being able to come up with the as you said like magic needs it comes from creation in order to have created a spell like this it's such a perversion of it and you can't even imagine the kind of person who'd have been able to make this sort of a thing it also leads him to have the hypothesis that we're looking for a woman killer because it's just so passionate and just so yeah this was a little bit right exactly you know he's, it's just so he, carnal that yeah it's he's not. like women feel more strongly and he's like women are just better at hating mm-hmm. yeah and murphy's <laughs> like well, what you talking about willis <laughs> exactly, so. he's like well you know i just feel she's like well is this something like only a woman can do and he's like well no she's like jesus christ dresden like you're such a pig which doesn't <laughs> help his whole which doesn't help his whole yeah ex- yeah that is that's sort of a good thing there that exactly he's like based on the fact that they were in such an intimate moment and exactly just exploded the passion and in them motion to that clearly it's a jealous woman uh, clearly oh, it's like oh, a right. jealous woman or something like that <laughs> yeah and murphy's like um is that like our only option and he's like well no and she's like oh seriously and he's like well okay fine but might have taken like a few people could have done this but yeah and that just leads to who the victims actually are uh and it's not just you know some random sieves off the street who you've got here is uh jennifer stanton who was an employee of the velvet room uh, yeah. which is a high class escort Exa- brothel. Boutique, brothel exactly <laughs> uh and then the mister is uh tommy tom uh who is uh a personal bodyguard to chicago's mob crime mob overlord. boss overlord syndicate etc etc uh johnny exactly of chicago yeah yeah uh so so yeah, so we have a, a high price call girl and a and a mafia enforcer. And on top of you and know that's just not good things to get. Yeah, well, the, and on top the, of the you know Tommy Tom being to Johnny Marcone, aka mob boss extraordinaire of the city. You've got Jennifer Stanton who is part of this uh, brothel, which is owned by Bianca, mm-hmm. who, as we will learn as the series progresses, is a red court vampire. Which just c- makes the politics of this whole murder just thick. Yeah, exactly. Harry's just like, oh, this just got ten times better. Things Great got thick. Harry day one, and it doesn't really ever. <laughs> yeah, the so water's never really clear I think from there. Jim does this just to sort of make sure that the 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 reader doesn't have a way to sort of try to guess right away. Oh, it's this guy that did it. Yeah, exactly. Just by it's by like... introducing immediately the most complicated way that these people could be involved by and weaving this really giant it's web. It's a total theme for Jim Butcher. You know, you've never just got a mob boss. You've never just got a vampire. You're going to always have like 18 of the absolute worst situations coming at Harry, to Harry all at once. At once. So it's yeah, like, and Harry's it is just hard like, to follow. Like, ooh, like, like, I just need a nap. Exactly. And every book is kind of like a race <laughs> to be like, no, look, they all want to kill him. None of them are the good guys. The yeah. only thing you're guessing at the end of the book is which one's going to get there first. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure, definitely. They and that's again one of the things I like about them is is that they're they're well paced, they're kind of fast paced, they're kind of jump in the action and go like you don't like, like again I I I've seen reference to, you know Harry Potter and stuff like that where you kind of have like some action and some stuff going on and then it'll kind of calm down for like a chapter or two while. You know, admittedly, the twelve-year-olds trying to figure out what the fuck is going on, right? And then they're like, "Oh, shit's happening!" And then they're like, oh, "Okay, no, wait, what is right?" Whereas Harry's just like fucking full steam ahead, right? Yeah, like it's just suddenly he gets dunked in the deep end, baptism by fire, whatever. He's in there, and it's just go, 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 and he does not have a lot of time to slow down and reflect. And and, and certainly, yeah, Jim Butcher has said like each book is written with the intention of Harry's worst weekend of the year. Yeah. Uh, he tends to get his butt handed to him <laughs> in several different kinds of ways it and is... spends the rest of the book very sore. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> basically all the time that passes in between books, you get anywhere between, you know, like three and 12 months between books and you've got like, it, it's kind of just assumed that, you know, like her boy was like in the hospital that whole time. Yeah, yeah. And he spent a chunk of it like, recovering. And he had some each of book his... starts out with like, I only just stopped being bruised like a week ago. Yeah, yeah. Then then he had some of his typical cases like his his 
you know, lost keys. And, yeah, they start throwing in and, short stories in you between know, stuff to like, fluff it out. Right, you're like, oh yeah, I'm sure some of his regular life happened in between, and this is just, yeah. Well, Harry tries to leave the uh, right. apartment to go make his appointment after that. He's, yeah. And, uh, you know, lucky for him, someone meets him outside. It's none other than... <laughs> lucky uh, for him. <laughs> gentleman Johnny Marcone, who <laughs> kind of insists that he join him for a car ride back to his apartment. His office, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's like, yeah, exactly. He, like, takes off and sort of realizes after a moment he kind of feels like he's being followed and then notices, like, this car pull up or whatever. And, yeah, they're like, here, let's give you a ride. He's like, no, no, I'm fine. They're like, no, really, let me give you a ride. He's like, okay. <laughs> So, yeah, so chapter three. Uh, So on the surface, Marcone doesn't look like an intimidating, organized crime lord, uh, but he is just that and rules Chicagoland. Marcone wants to hire Harry to not investigate the murder at the Madison, offering Harry two full weeks of pay. Harry, of course, doesn't agree to that, and in his refusal of Marcone's offer, they lock eyes. Cue soul gates. Harry initially thinks he's getting one up on Gentleman Johnny, but after the soul gaze is complete, he realizes that Marcone manipulated him and that Marcone got more out of it than Harry did. This rattles Harry. He does his best not to let it show how much is thrown him. Uh, Marcone backs off on his attempt to get Dresden to stay out of his business, and Harry is dropped off outside of his office building. So this is our our new introduction to our, our anti- I don't know, what's the word? Sorry. No. Antagonist? Antagonist, thank you. Antagonist, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we've got Harry, we've got Murph, who's an ally, and now we've got Gentleman Johnny Marcone, and we are going with the pronunciation Marcone because um, I looked up some crap with, I, I heard Butcher in an interview or whatever say Marcone. So this is what we're going with because initially I was one of the ones when, when I when I heard Marster said Marconi in the book, and that worked fine for me. I pictured it how it's spelled and when I actually picked up a physical copy of the book I was like yeah that's Marconi to me and it just seemed to fit with the Johnny like the gentleman Johnny Marconi kind of yeah the whole Italian mobster whatever Um, and then after the third or fourth book in the the audio recordings Marster switches to Marcone and at first I was like what that's that's bullshit what (laughs) Um, so yeah so I have yeah so I was like okay how does Jim Butcher pronounce it so assuming that Butcher will always pronounce it the way he wants it pronounced and that he's not caving to peer pressure, I'm going to assume that it is meant to be Marcone, so we will call him Marcone. Right, and our our definite repeated description of Johnny Marcone is the green dollar bills. The cold, bills. faded faded dollar yeah, bill the tiger the green, soul. The tiger soul, yeah. And this is what they get out of the... Um, the soul gaze. So yeah. So when they when they first go in, um, you know, he introduces himself and that. And I I, I think sort of Harry's got it just already. Like um, I don't think you know he he he's never before in any of his cases or anything like that. He's never had interactions. He's never really crossed into Mark Houghton's world before. But again, just being the sort of stuff that Harry does, being that he's um, involved in in helping the police, and being that he does private investigation and, and it's Chicago and, and this is his town. He just, he sort of has a general idea. He knows who Marconi is kind of a thing. Um, so yeah. So when he first kind of gets pulled over, he's like, Oh shit. I think and then he's like, yeah, I'm John Marconi. And he's like, Oh fuck me. <laughs> um, so yeah. So, but Harry also, um, very adamantly states he doesn't like bullies and that. So Marconi's like, yeah, you don't, you don't want to look into this. You're just going to leave it alone. And Harry's like, fuck you. No, like, He's quite rash in the way that he deals with it. Oh, he's... Marcone ends up being this very rational and controlled very calm, and methodical. Calm. Whereas as the, the, all of the reactions that Harry has are very guttural and fear and whatever he... Reaction, he reactionary, just, yeah. Instantaneous. Yeah, he, he doesn't like bullies and he doesn't really like authority figures. <laughs> and Marcone is... And not is, to mention that he's afraid. And he mentions straight and, point, and, and, right? and he, he is, is afraid. Yeah, he's like, this is not good. I just got pulled over by the mobster and, you know, two or three of his cronies because, like you say, they, they tried to snake him outside the hotel and he just started booking it um, in order to, to make his appointment. So, um, so yeah, he's, he's like not too comfy. He's now, you know, locked in the back of it. And it's funny cause he, he, he likes to, he rips, he's, he pokes some jabs at, at Hendrix, who is a big football-esque type player who's driving the car. Um, 
And he's like, hey, Hendrix, you put your seatbelt on, right? And Hendrix is kind of sneering at him in the rear view, like, fuck you. And then he's like, of course, I didn't put my seatbelt on because I want to be able to bail out of here at a second's notice just in case I feel shit's going down. Um, but he's like, it didn't stop me from giving him a hard time. So, um, so yeah, so he's kind of nervous, doesn't really know what's going on. And Marcon's just like, yeah, how, like, like, what's your daily, you know, fee or whatever? And he's like, like, 1200 12 1250 yeah, and then Harry's just kind of like, well, fuck you, that's not the way, like, one, that's just not me anyways, two, he's like, the police have already asked me to look into it, so I have to look into it, I can't just not, like, they've already hired me to do it, right, and Marcone's like, are you sure, because you could just, you know, pretend not, or whatever, and Harry's like, yeah, no, no, and so Marcone's like, well, and so yeah, so then Harry's like, really, John, I don't think I like, and sort of, you know, looks around to look him dead in the eyes, and thinking he's gonna, you know, freak Marcone out. And yeah, they, they go into the soul gaze. So anytime a wizard locks eyes with someone, they, they see you for who you really are and you get to see them. And, and this is one of the earliest um, snippets from the book, one of the audio clips that we had. So it was, yeah, they get to see you the same way. Um, and boy, does it go ever wrong for him. Yeah, so... Marcone's kind of scary. It's it's this this well ordered kind of barren, like a cold steel. Refer- you know what? Here, I am just going to read you the description of Marcone's soul because I can't really do it um, justice. It isn't the money, John. I told him. I lazily locked my eyes onto his. I just don't think it's going to work out. To my surprise, he didn't look away. So part of this is so we're not really sure where Marcone falls on all of this but given that he sort of has an idea of who harry is and what's going on again you sort of get the idea that marcone is is willing to have sort of an open mind to to the arcane to the supernatural world right he might not be completely savvy but again certainly like murphy murphy yeah smart enough to believe smart enough to yeah like he doesn't know yeah like yeah exactly there's they can't know everything there's got to be some stuff I've seen some things um, and and open to the possibility that, you know, there's stuff I may not know. So let's just see how this, right? Um, so, yes, yeah, so he's like, so to my surprise, he didn't look away. Those who deal in magic learn to see the world in a slightly different light than everyone else. You gain a perspective you've never considered before, a way of thinking that just nev- that would just never have occurred to you without the exposure to the things a wizard sees and hears. When you look into someone's eyes, you see them in that other light. And, for just a second, they see you in the same way. Marcone and I looked at one another. He was a soldier, a warrior, behind that relaxed smile and fatherly manner. He wasn't going to get what he wanted, or he was going to get what he wanted, and he was going to get it in the most efficient way possible. He was a dedicated man, dedicated to his goals, dedicated to his people. He never let fear affect him. He made a living on human misery and suffering, peddling in drugs and flesh and stolen goods, and he took steps to minimize that suffering because it was simply the most efficient means of running his business. He was furious over Tommy Tom's death, a cold and practical kind of fury that his rightful dominion had been invaded and challenged. He intended to find those responsible and deal with them in his own way, and he didn't want the police interfering. He had killed before and would again, and it would all mean nothing more to him than a business transaction, than paying for groceries in the checkout line. It was a dry and cool place inside Gentleman Johnny Marcone, except for one dim corner— There, hidden away from his everyday thoughts, there lurked a secret shame. I couldn't quite see what it was, but I knew that somewhere in the past there was something that he would give anything to undo, would spill blood to erase. It was from that dark place that he drew his resolve, his strength. That was the way I saw him when I looked inside, past all his pretenses and defenses, and I was, on some instinctual level, certain that he had been aware of what I would see of what I would see if I looked, that he had deliberately met my gaze knowing what he would give away. That was his purpose in getting me alone. He wanted to take a peek at my soul. He wanted to see what sort of man I was. Um, so, yeah, so he's like, yeah, Marcone looked at him to see the things that Harry was willing and capable of doing. Um, he's like, most people who did that got really pale, at least. One woman had passed out entirely. I don't know what they saw when they looked in there. It wasn't a place I poked around much myself. 
And he's like, Marcon wasn't like other people who had seen my soul. He didn't even blink an eye. He just looked and assessed. Um, and just a second later, so he's like, at first, um, I, Harry's like, he's like, first thing I felt was anger, anger at being manipulated, anger that he should presume to soul gaze upon me. Just a second later, I felt scared to death of this man. I had looked on his soul, and it had been as solid and barren as a stainless steel refrigerator. It was more than unsettling. He was strong inside, savage and merciless without being cruel. He had a tiger soul. So yeah, so Harry's like, you don't want to mess around with this guy. Like, he can, when he needs to be all business, he's all business. So don't mess with him stuff. Don't invade his things. Like, this is his dominion. This is his property. This is his guy. But at the same time, he's just going to be very cold and calculated, very, you know, um, meeting out what he feels is is suitable, whether it's, you know, we're going to chop off a finger or we're going to, you know... Just to the cold calculation of what business needs. Yeah, right? And and just that, yeah, he's like, this isn't a police matter. I don't want, you know, the guy arrested, right? He's like, you took one of mine, I took one of yours. Like, this is very, um... Oh, what's the untouchables? Mm, yes. Right? Right? You put one of ours in the hospital, we put one of yours in the morgue, you know? So, yeah, this is... Yeah, Marcone is, is very much of a checklist his. sort of a follow-up. Yeah, so he's got his own code, and this is this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. All right, um, so I'd say that probably concludes our chapter three. <laughs> yeah. Anything else you want to add, Jess, to Marcone? And- well, again, this just sets up Marcone for the rest of the series, too. It's that... Yeah. This is another man, like much like Harry and Murphy, he is set in his ways, he has his own code, and he does not waver from that Yeah, set of belief and operations. Yeah, and I think this, when Harry sort of is like, oh, I realized sort of what was going on, is I think that says something else about, to me anyways, how Marcone, like, not that I necessarily would have noticed it like my first time around, but it was like, oh, again, this sort of indicates that, that Marcone knows a little something about a little something. Because again, this soul gaze didn't seem to catch him completely yeah, off nothing guard. Really phases so him at whether all. yeah, so part of that is just Marcone, I think, and like I say, his his unwillingness to to show reaction. To, he's not going to give anything away by giving a reaction. But at the same time, when Harry's like, "Oh, I kind of feel like he did this on purpose," it's like we don't know that Marcone necessarily had any other soul gazes at any other time but he might have heard enough read enough something somewhere that that he knew that this was a potential to happen that if that if he met harry's gaze harry being a wizard that he might get some insight or whatever right so again it lets you know that marcone is like yeah i I kind of you know is yeah learning to has, has been sort of somewhat exposed to the supernatural world and his arming himself as well as he's capable um, in regards to that, as with anything and everything else he comes in contact right. with. So, if it's business, he knows business. If it's politics, he knows politics. If it's crime, he knows crime. Like, oh shit, there's some supernatural. All right, what do I need to know? Let me let me learn about this supernatural. Oh, and that's it. That's actually one of my favorite interactions too, because Marcon is like, oh, they say you know things or whatever, right? And Harry's like, they also say I'm nutty as a fruitcake. You know, Marcon is like. Mm, rather particular about which they I listen to right so again yeah very he, measured and very, planned very yeah. measured planned he mm-hmm. he takes in a lot and sorts through it he doesn't just you know go for the google headlines he's not like fake news as Marcone does his research and he has people to look into stuff and he does yeah you know, again right shit's going on there's some supernatural the wizards involved I'm gonna get right in with the wizard and be like yo you're either for or against me kind of a here right so yeah, so Harry's got his plates full and then gets dumped out of the car in front of his building and he's he's just very, yeah, so he's shaken, he's rattled, he's like, this is a seriously scary dude, I can kind of see why he's come in and laid claim to Chicago and why he's in charge and nobody operates here without his say-so. Um, and he's like, fuck, now I'm on his radar because he knows who I am I and, and yeah. he knows about me. And he now tried he tried to pay me off and I said no. Tried to pay me off and I'm like, mm, ain't going to happen. So so then he took a little a little looky-loo, a little peek inside. And he's like, okay, now I really know who you are, Dresden. And Dresden's like, well, fuck, you're scary and I don't really know what you saw in me. And um, I still have to go meet my, my, my appointment about this maybe missing husband and fuck, I don't care about this right now because there's like death and murder and mayhem so yeah it's been established that Marcone is very protective about his people I don't know if you said it or not like how he's very much about like these are my guys I'm going to be the one to 
take charge here and handle his own. Exactly, you know, like it's not just about police interference that he doesn't want. It's also just about like I have a reputation here that needs to be maintained because it's also been established that Marcone uh, became the gang leader uh, roughly six months after Harry and Murphy met. So that's only been about two, two and a half years ago mm-hmm. uh, before Stormfront is established. So he's very new. It's also, you know, it's said that he's done a hell of a job, you know, that even the cops have to kind of tip their hat to him and say, like, all right, this guy has, you know, he's a gangster and we don't contone crime, but at the same time, he's the lesser of evils because at the moment he's running a very regimented, you know, there's not killings in the streets over prostitutes or whatever, you know, it's like he owns all the prostitutes and all the drug dealers and all of the middlemen, so there's no reason for there to be a gang war, turf war in that situation. So sure, crime is still going on, but there's a bit of an elegance to it that even the cops are like, you know what, we don't have the time to deal with this. There's enough going on that needs our attention. So, you know, even Murphy and Harry both say throughout the books, like, we're coming for you one day, Marcone. You're lucky enough to not be high enough on our list yet. You're lucky enough to be doing your side of the job well enough. But they're like, but you're still a piece of shit, and we're still gonna... (laughs) We're still going to take you down one day. Don't forget that. Right. So it's a little bit of it. Marcone is like, listen, these are all my people. I own all of them. And if I'm going to maintain owning all of them, I'm going to fucking put the fear of God into any of them, too. So tell you and your little wizard friends, you and your little cop friends, fuck off. I've got a reputation here that is much bigger than you and your dingy little office and SI. This concludes our episode, Green Eyes and Broken Hearts. Thank you for listening. You can check us out online at freeflowrambling.com and mickanallies.ca. There we have links to our other podcasts, social media, and other fun tidbits. Tune in for our next episode where we cover chapters 4 through 6. We are Free Flow Rambling. Conjure by it at your own risk. <laughs>